The Lord be with you. Uh, welcome everyone, those of you who were brave enough to come today. Blessings and peace to you as we gather. Um, because of our numbers, we've decided to do a condensed, sort of a simplified version of our service today. So the bulletin will be our basic guide, but we will, um, we will simplify. We won't sing the full liturgy, and we'll just sing a verse or two of each of the hymns. But we will gather first at the font of our baptism and uh, turn to, in your hymnal to page 94 for confession and forgiveness. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we've done, by what we have left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. For his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn. <coughs> Five twenty in your hymnal, in your red hymnal, five twenty, and we'll sing verses one and four. One and four, dearest Jesus, at your word. <clears throat> the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day praising you, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. 
The first lesson is from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of the Lord was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel, that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever, for the iniquity that he knew, because of his sons who were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, Here I am, Eli said. What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me, of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. We shall read responsively Psalm 139. O Lord, you have stretched me and known me. You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was with you who formed in my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made, when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, 
for the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Here in the readings. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for today, the second Sunday of Epiphany, is from the first chapter of St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Oops, this is not the Gospel reading. <laughs> and I need to get my Bible. One moment, please. Gospels from John chapter 1. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was in Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, I, you will see heaven's, oh, heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. That was the gospel reading you heard, not what was printed in the bulletin. So, sorry about that mistake. <clears throat> a lot of people today, these days, talk about, the, use the word balance, balancing your life. As in, we're living in lopsided lives and we need to find ways to bring balance back to, back to them. Or we spend too much time on the wrong things and not enough time on the right things, or there's not enough time for me, or life is basically good, but there's a hole. There's one part of my life that is lacking. I need to bring balance back to my life. We hear that a lot. And of course, balance on the surface is a good thing. As a pastor, I have advised people in the past that they must not neglect their spiritual side. That's an important message and part of my role to make room for God in their lives. For a long time, this seemed to be good advice. We all need to invest in our spiritual side. If we think of our life as sort of a pie chart, there, is, or there are various elements in our lives. There's the physical, the emotional, the relational, the mental, all different slices in the pie. And of course, we can't forget the spiritual. That was my advice. <clears throat> balance, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> balance is a good goal to have. But I confess that when I read the gospel today, I have to rethink things. Because based on the life and teachings of Jesus, I am rethinking things. Because when we encounter Jesus in the gospels, we, as we do this morning, we don't hear anything from him about balance, about a balanced lifestyle. The fact is that Jesus calls us to something radically different. Nowhere is this more clearly than the way Jesus calls his disciples today. I'm sorry I don't have it printed for you, but if you listen to the, if you listen to the beginning, 
The story is about the call of Philip. Jesus comes to Philip. He finds Peter and John and Andrew on the shore of the Lake of Galilee. And when he meets them, what does he say to them? What does he offer them when he finds them doing their business, casting their nets in the sea? Does he offer a balance? <clears throat> no. Does he say, Philip, I would like a moment of your time to present an opportunity for you to consider. I think you have a pretty good life on the whole, but wouldn't you benefit from some new spiritual principles that could offer you peace of mind, a positive self-image, and unlock your potential? If I can just have an hour or so of your time, I believe that you can take these principles with you and find ways to fit me into your busy life. What do you think, Philip? Of course, that's not what Jesus said. He never said such things. Not even close. We may wish that he had said this. We may wish that he came simply to offer us guidelines and principles, a spiritual perspective that would make our lives more manageable more convenient and more pleasant. And many churches seem to think that Jesus did that to make offers like this and are busy trying to market Jesus as the true vendor of the balanced lifestyle. But what does Jesus actually say to Philip today? He says two words, follow me, follow me. And that's it. As in get up. Leave your old life behind and follow where I am going and do it now, right now. Obey me. And again, in another gospel, he finds Matthew, the tax collector, and he says the same thing to him. Follow me. And to the rich man, he says, you need to do one thing. You need to give all that you have to the poor and follow me. To other potential disciples, he says, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And to others, he says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Does that sound like balance to you? Does that sound like Jesus is asking only for a minor adjustment from us? I don't think so. Jesus is consistent. Any encounter with him is always a call, a call from him a call out of the old, a call to leave the old behind and begin again. He doesn't come to you presenting a series of brochures for you to consider that may enrich and bring balance to your life. He comes calling. He says, get up, leave your life behind and follow me. So there's the problem. Do you understand the problem? Do you understand why the search for a balanced life is never the same thing as the call of Jesus to follow. The writer, John Ortberg, explains the problem this way. He says, the word balance tends to carry with it the notion that we're trying to make our lives more manageable, more convenient, more pleasant, and it is largely a middle-class pursuit. The concept of balance lacks the notion that my life is to be given to something bigger than myself. And then he sums his argument beautifully when he says, the quest for balance lacks the call to sacrifice and self-denial, the wild, risky, costly, adventurous abandon of following Jesus. I don't think I need to say that Jesus today is not promoting an, un is not promoting an unbalanced, unhealthy lifestyle. I hope not. I hope you don't think that way. I don't need to say that Neither that we are automatically today to go quit our jobs tomorrow, empty our bank accounts, and hit the streets in Jesus' name. I hope you don't think that either. But that's about as far as I'm prepared to go with explanations, because I don't want to let myself off the hook or any of us. For I seek to follow this Jesus, the same Jesus who demanded much. No, not much. The same Jesus who demanded everything from Philip and Levi and Peter, and last of all, me. I know when I read of the call of these disciples that I stand in line with them. I know too that whenever I read my Bible or begin to say a prayer or gather around the communion rail as we will in a few moments, I will always hear again and again and again one message from my Lord, and that message will not be, 
let me give you some helpful hints or useful ideas or spiritual nuggets to bring balance to your life and bring some balance and make you feel better. The message is constant, unrelenting, and always his first and last message. Those two words, follow me, follow me. Leave your old life behind, get up, leave behind, and follow me. Well, how on earth does that happen? How do we leave the old behind, stand up and follow in the here and now, in the reality that we live in? Well, the first thing we need to, we have to understand that what we need is not what we, th we may think we need. Because when Jesus says, follow me, how quickly we jump to the conclusion that this means that he wants us to smarten up <laughs> or get our lives together. How often have I heard that phrase, get my spiritual life together? So we work at praying more regularly or trying to master another discipline. But usually this ends up with us feeling like the religious equivalent of going on a diet or trying to stick to a budget, to do the right things for the wrong reasons. But discipleship is not a self-improvement project. Neither is it a path to become merely better people. If it were a self-improvement project, then it would be nothing but bad news. It would just be one more effort on my part to become better through my own sweat and struggle and tears. And that's never good news. It's just more work with the burden squarely on my shoulders. So do you want to hear something that really is good news this morning for a change? Listen carefully then. I'll tell you this. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good, but dead people alive. Now that, friends, is good news. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good, but dead people alive. This is good news because this is what we really need. Jesus will never be content to simply fit into your life. He calls you always to come and die with him and let him raise you again. And for we Lutherans, of course, there are two main places this happens each and every time we gather. The first place is our baptism. This is not a once-in-a-lifetime event that happened years ago when we were little babies. Not at all. Listen here again and memorize these words from the Catechism if you haven't already, because nothing is a clearer statement of what follow me means for disciples than this. The Catechism says, In baptism, the old person in us is to be drowned through daily sorrow for sin and repentance, and that daily a new person is to come forth and rise up to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. The second place where we're called, called to follow Jesus so we may die and rise with him is around the communion rail in the Lord's Supper. Again, words from the small catechism guide us. Forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation are given to us in the sacrament through these words given and shed for you, because where there is forgiveness of sin, there is also life and salvation. So in the bread and the wine, the true body and blood of our Lord, we believe there is new life for us. Let me say it again. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good, but dead people alive. This is the joy of discipleship, brothers and sisters. The joy is that Jesus doesn't do patch-up jobs or balance work. Instead, he calls us to follow. He comes strictly to bury and raise us, and he does that every day. That is the joy of our sacramental promises, the word, the water, the bread, and the wine. We don't need fishnets or a beach. We don't need to be roaming the streets of Galilee to be found and called by Jesus. We have our baptisms. We have the Holy Supper. We need to be buried and raised with Jesus. This is our daily follow me moment with the Lord. Leave the old, let Jesus bury and raise you and lead you this day into the chance to give your life away for the sake of the world. Die, rise, follow, repeat, says the Lord. No checking your success rate so far. No examining your progress so far. No condemn, condemning of all the falling down and the failing so far. And all the feeble attempts in the past to find yourself, to improve yourself. 
No keeping track of spiritual successes and failures. None of that matters. What matters is now. Jesus stands before you and me and calls, follow me. And Jesus is relentless, always calling every day. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good, but dead people alive. Today is start again day. Return to the waters, be washed, cleansed, made whole, called out again. Come to the table and eat and drink. No patch up jobs, no duct tape fix it ups, no self improvement plans here. Today for you there is only one thing on offer. There is only your dying and raising and new birth on today's agenda with Jesus. That's today's offer. That is Jesus' offer every single day. And that's good news from our Lord. Follow me. Follow me. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is in the red hymnal. <clears throat> Excuse me. 574. And again, we will sing the first, first and the, th well, we'll sing the whole thing. It's only three verses. We'll sing all three verses. Here I am, Lord.
prayer time. Let us pray. O oh God, you called Samuel to be your prophet. Your son Jesus called Philip and Nathaniel to be his disciples. Fill the church with your spirit, so it heeds Jesus' call to follow him. Give it preachers, professors, and people who are faithful to your word. Use the church to draw many to Jesus, the salvation of the whole world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless this congregation of St. John's as we seek to do your will. Keep us steadfast in faith. Conform us to Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Spirit, you have placed this congregation amidst many who are suffering on our streets. We particularly pray for those who have no permanent roofs over their heads. Particularly in these cold winter days, we pray for those struggling to survive in encampments. We pray for city leaders and enforcement officers as they struggle to deal with this crisis with compassion and dignity, and yet seeking first the safety and welfare of those who live there. Help us all to work at the roots of the homeless problem among us, so all may find a safe, healthy, and lasting place to call home. Lord, in your mercy. Send the power of your Holy Spirit into the hearts of all who suffer, especially those we name in our hearts before you now. We remember Kadira Fraser. Fill them with health and hope. Bless all who minister to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, thank you for your servants who followed you in this life and now abide in your presence. Grant those we too, grant that we too heed your gracious invitation given through your dear Son. Make us into living temples of your Spirit. Lead us into your presence with Samuel and all the faithful people of Israel, with Nathaniel and Philip and all the apostles, martyrs, and saints of your church. Amen. Are there any other requests for prayer this morning? To your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I think instead of gathering the offering this morning, we'll just ask if you have an offering to give it to Jason on the way out. That would be fine. Jason is standing in the back there, so we'll, we'll handle the offering that way today. Please rise. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved Son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of, all, of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O God. You surround us with your glory and mercy. And in the splendor of your heavenly light, you lead us through the darkness of this world. 
You led your people Israel by a pillar of fire as you delivered them from bondage and brought them to the promised land. By the light of Bethlehem's star, you led the sages to your beloved son, revealing him to the nations as King of kings and Lord of lords. In words, signs, and wonders, your son gave the light of hope to the disappointed and healing to the disenchanted. Then at the appointed time, he stretched out his hands on the cross, showing forth the brilliance of a life freely given that all may have life in him. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Pray that by your Holy Spirit you will bless and sanctify this Holy Communion, that we may be illumined in faith as we partake of Christ's body and blood, renewed in the forgiveness of sins, and joyous in our hope for your eternal kingdom. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The light has shattered the darkness. Let us follow the star and behold our God. We invite those who wish to receive communion to please come forward at this time. Please rise. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Blessings. Thank you for being here again. Stay warm and stay safe going home again. Um, I just let you know that next week is our first Sunday, our first Sunday where we won't have a service here. We are invited to St. Ansgar's at 10:30, just to the north. They'll have, they'll be welcoming us at that time. Those who want to come. So, not too many here to hear that, but we've made that advertisement, I think, pretty clear, and it's in our calendar. So, hopefully, that will. That will work well. Thank you, Laura, for coming, keeping us musically inclined and uh, uh, for braving this cold weather. And all of you for coming. May God's blessings and peace be with you this week. And uh, we will sing our final hymn, 314. Check to see what the verse is. Arise, your light has come. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. One and four. Please stand. <laughs> 